But when I have done it in the past, it's not very easy. Running gets difficult fast, right? There are times when you're running where you want to quit, where you want to stop, where you just want to die, man. You want it to be over. And Paul is comparing this life to a race. He's running a race. And listen, it's not a sprint. Uh, for some of us, our life is shorter than others, but ultimately we're running a marathon. I mean, this is a grueling race that we're on. And for Paul, even harder than most, right? Paul, facing persecution everywhere he goes, being beaten and thrown into prison everywhere he goes, being persecuted for righteousness' sake, persecuted for uh, preaching the gospel everywhere he goes, it, it, it's hard for him. And he's saying, look, I don't count my life as dear to myself because I want to finish my race with joy. I want to be able to cross the finish line smiling and recognizing I've done the will of the Lord on this race that I was running. And, and in, in another place, Paul also talks about running this race. And he says, look, we run to win the prize. We want to run not only to just finish, but we want to run to win. Now, I was, uh, last night I was thinking about this, and I was remembering when Corey was leaving to go to Kenya a little over a year ago, 2019, he was leaving to go to Kenya and I was helping him move out of his apartment, him and Vanessa. We were moving them, putting all their stuff into a storage, uh, into a truck to move. And uh, we were talking about this guy from Kenya who had just set a world record pace for running a marathon, okay, 26.2 miles. He ran it in under two hours. It's something that the world never thought was possible. Like, literally, they thought it couldn't be done, that, that it was beyond the ceiling of the human body to be able to run a marathon in under two hours. You realize that if you run a marathon in under two hours, that means you run a pace of four minutes and 32 seconds per mile. I have never ran a mile that fast, ever. One mile. I'm talking about one mile, okay? He kept up that pace for 26.2 miles. But here's what you have to recognize when you... You can go to YouTube, you can watch him do it, and when he's doing it, you're going to see that there is a team of people around him. That he's not doing it by himself. He's not just out on a back road somewhere running a 26.2 mile race in under two hours. It, it, he has a whole team of pace setters around him, 35 other runners that were running with him, and they were ro on a rotation so they could keep him on that pace. He had a car, a pace car that he was following that would shine a laser on the ground so that he could watch that laser and run along with it that was setting the time for him so that he could do it. So here's the thing. Paul says he wants to finish his race with joy, that he's going bound by the Spirit to Jerusalem, but recognize that Paul is not doing it alone. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. He hasn't designed it that way. He has surrounded you with people to accompany you in the race that you're running. And the problem with us, most of the time, is we want to do it alone. And I don't know if it's because of our pride. I don't know if it's because we want some of the glory when we cross that finish line to say, I did it all on my own. But here's the thing. The Lord has equipped you with people all around you to help you run this race well. And Paul is not going alone, bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. He has a whole team around. Not only that, he has the Holy Spirit who lives in him. I thank God that I can look out on this congregation. I can recognize that uh, the Lord has equipped me with people to run this race with me. I thank God for my wife, man. If it wasn't for her, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do this. I would have quit this race a long time ago. But he surrounded me with people who are equipping me, who are accompanying me, who are coming alongside me to help me run this race well. It, 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 it's... I recognize as I stand up here to share this with you this morning that throughout this whole week in preparation that there have been men and women all around me equipping me and helping me to be able to have time to spend in his word and be able to commune with the Lord so that I could share with you this morning. I think about even this morning, I wake up and, and my oldest son Jackson wants to come with me to church because I get here crazy early because I'm weird and I feel like I need time all by myself in the morning and he wanted to come and it breaks his heart when he can't come with me. But I'm so grateful that my wife is there with him to help him get ready for church, to help all the kids, to feed him breakfast and to get him here. The Lord has given me people in my life to help me run this race. And I say that to you this morning to recognize that uh, the Lord has given you people. Don't take them for granted. As Paul is saying goodbye to these elders of Ephesus on the shore of Miletus, look at what happens. They wept freely. They cried. 
They were weeping and they fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Why? Because Paul spent almost three years in Ephesus coming alongside these men so that they could run their race well. Paul was equipping them and pouring into them and teaching them, striving with them so that they could run their race well. And now Paul is saying, I'm going and I'm never coming back. You're never going to see me again on this side of heaven. Paul recognizes that he's marching to his death. And even though he wanted to meet with these men and they're weeping freely, and they're weeping because of what he said that they would see his face no more, I want to point you to verse 1 of chapter 21. It says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail. Now when you read this in the English, in, in the King James or New King James, it doesn't give you the right connotation that you, that you get in the Greek. If you read it in the Greek, what it really says is that after we tore ourselves away from them. After we tore ourselves away from them. So not only were the Ephesian elders weeping and hanging on Paul and crying because they weren't going to see him anymore. Paul and the, uh, his, his men that were with him had to tear themselves away from them. Not only because they wanted them to stay, but because Paul's heart was with them as well. Not only had Paul just poured into these men, but these men had poured into Paul. It's the same today. The, the, the pastor is not uh, set apart in some way where I don't need you guys to pour into me. I recognize in all the ways that you guys bless me throughout the week, that you guys are, are there for me. The, the people who come and they clean the church, what a blessing that is so we can come and have a clean church to meet in. The people who do children's ministry, the people who serve in every aspect, every way that needs, that needs to happen around here. Everybody's serving and pouring in and helping, and that blesses me. You guys are pouring into me. Paul had to tear himself away from the Ephesian elders, knowing that he was marching to his death, knowing that it was the will of the Lord, but his heart was with them. And so it says, now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to cause... And the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship, sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed in Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. So what do we see here? Paul is leaving uh, the shore of Miletus, and he's sailing through the Mediterranean Sea, and he's going eastward, and he's heading towards the region of Syria, and ultimately towards Jerusalem, right? And I like this because of how detailed Luke is, and he gives us all this uh, information, all the way to the point of they passed Cyprus on the left. Listen, i got to be honest with you. I was reading this, and I'm like, there are no vain words in the Bible at all, right? I believe that. Every word is inspired by God. Every word is useful. But I'm like, why did he say they passed it on the left? What does it matter? Why does that matter? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I know that it's not for nothing. I know that it's not vain, but I'm just telling you, I just like how detailed Luke is. We can follow him along in the picture in our mind. We can follow them along on their trip back to Syria, right? And so they're going to Phoenicia, and Phoenicia really is, is borders Syria. Tyre and Sidon and all that is in Phoenicia. And so this is a 400-mile trip as they gain, as they, uh, uh, from Patara to Phoenicia as they get on the ship. And it seems that they're on a cargo ship. Up until this point, they're making like 30-mile treks, and then they get on this ship, and they sail all the way to Phoenicia, which is a 400-mile uh, journey, and it seems that they make it straight. They don't stop on the island of Cyprus. They just go all the way to Phoenicia, and they land in Tyre. Now, this is the first time that we see Paul in Tyre, okay? We, we haven't read about him landing in Tyre at any point, uh, going through Tyre. We haven't, we haven't read at all about anything happening in this region, and then it says... For there the ship was to unload her cargo, look at verse 4, and finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. This is amazing to me. We, we, we haven't read anything in the Bible yet of anything going on in Tyre. We've read about what's happening in Antioch and Syria. We've read about what's happening north of that into the region of Galatia, all the way into Macedonia and surrounding areas, all the way into Greece and, and Corinth. We've read about all kinds of amazing things going on, but we haven't read anything about anything happening in Tyre. And all of a sudden, Paul lands there. And what does he find? Believers. He finds disciples there in Tyre. I love that. 
all of a sudden, remember what the Lord had said to them. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples on the day of ascension. He said, I want you to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the earth. And all of a sudden, Paul comes into Tyre. He hadn't maybe heard of anything happening there yet. And there are believers there. The Holy Spirit is, is doing a work. The gospel has spread. People are getting saved all over the map. What I love about that is Acts is given to us. It's an amazing book. It details what happens in the early church through the apostles, what, what, what the Holy Spirit was doing through the apostles. But there's still more to the story that we don't yet know which I'm excited about. I think when we step into the shores of heaven that we'll be able to know fully all the things that were going on in the early church. Not only that, throughout history, throughout time, you recognize that right now there are people meeting all over the world, I mean everywhere in the whole world, to worship Jesus. That they're lifting up their voices, that they're singing praises, that they're studying his word. And I think, really, when we step into heaven, we'll get to meet all of them and hear the stories about what the Lord was doing all over the world throughout all of time. That's exciting to me. It's exciting to me because no matter how many times we read the book of Acts, no matter how many times we study it on this side of heaven, we'll never come to the fullness of it. We'll never, we're never going to come to the fullness of the depth of, it, of the knowledge of his word, not on this side of heaven. And I think for all of eternity we'll be learning of it. But also there are things going on in the world, even at this time in the first century, that we don't even read about in Acts. I'm, exciting. I'm excited to know about them. I'm excited to hear what was happening, what the Lord was doing. And so it says they land in Tyre. They find disciples there, they, and, and they stayed with them seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Now, I, I want to just talk about this for a second. There is division among Bible teachers as to whether or not Paul was disobedient in going to Jerusalem. Okay, There's a debate about that. Because it says, we're going to read it a couple times here in this chapter, that they, they were, he was prophesied to... To not go to Jerusalem. And so there's division. Well, was Paul supposed to go to Jerusalem or was he not? Well, remember what Paul says in chapter 20. He says, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. So here's what I believe. Paul was completely obedient in going to Jerusalem. He was obedient. He was doing what the Lord had told him to do, what the Lord had laid on his heart to do. And I, I also believe that all these things that the people are saying about not going to Jerusalem, they're warnings from the Holy Spirit to prepare Paul not to stop him from going, to prepare him and not to prevent him. And so I believe that the Holy Spirit is laying it on the hearts of these people to tell him that there's danger in Jerusalem, just like they had been testifying to him in every city, and the Holy Spirit himself has been testifying to Paul in every city that chains and, and tribulations await him in Jerusalem. And I also think that there's a little bit of misinterpretation going on in the hearts of people because they love Paul. And the Holy Spirit is impressing on their heart that chains and tribulations are awaiting Paul, that he's going to have trouble in Jerusalem, and they don't want that for him. I think we have to be really careful when the Holy Spirit lays something on our hearts to not add ourself into that. To not add our own affections and our own thoughts into what the Holy Spirit is laying on our hearts. It's important. That's an easy thing to do. I think the Holy Spirit was testifying to these believers that trouble was awaiting Paul. And as a result, they're interpreting that as saying to Paul, hey, don't go. But I think Paul was obedient. Not only that, in chapter 23, you don't have to go there, but in chapter 23, Paul is in tribulation in Jerusalem. Okay, he's arrested, he's in jail. And who comes to Paul in jail? Jesus. And what does he say? He says, you've testified here in Jerusalem, but you're now you're going to have to also testify in Rome. And from Jesus' estimate, Paul had a good testimony in Jerusalem. He doesn't say, Paul, I've told you over and over again not to come here. Now look at you, you're in jail. No, he says, good job, Paul. You're doing exactly what I wanted you to do. And not only that, now I'm going to take you to Rome and you're going to testify to the most powerful man in the world. 
I think Paul was walking obedient to the Spirit. But listen, it's important to you to hear. It's, it's important for you to hear this. There are times where the Holy Spirit asks you to do something that makes no earthly sense. It's important that you are bathed in prayer. It's important that you know the word of God. It's important that you can discern the voice of God so that when he's asking you to do something, even well-intentioned brothers and sisters who come alongside you and try to talk you out of that, if you're sure that you've heard from the voice of the Lord, you need to be sure. Paul was sure. Now listen, here's what I can tell you. Whatever private interpretation that you've received from the Lord... It will never, ever, ever, ever disagree with his word. Ever. Ever. It will never disagree with God's word ever. And so when you come and say, yeah, no, uh, the Holy Spirit testified that I should be living with my girlfriend before we're married. That's, uh, he just wants me to. And then someone comes alongside you and says, no, what are you talking about? No, you shouldn't be doing that. And you say, well, the Holy Spirit told me. No. That disagrees with his word. God is not schizophrenic. He doesn't change his mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord your God. I change not. So if it's in his word, it's written in stone in eternity forever. And so anything that you're hearing from the Lord, first and foremost, has to agree with his word. Paul was sure. He was bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. Even knowing all these things that waited him there. Even knowing that it was crazy. Even knowing to these other believers in Tyre that it didn't make earthly sense to them and their heart was bound up in it and they didn't want him to go because they didn't want him to die, Paul knew the Holy Spirit is beckoning me. He's convinced of his conviction before the Lord. And so it says, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way and they all accompanied us. Listen how beautiful this is. They're Paul just met them seven days ago. He just met them. I, I mean, as far as we know, he had never even been to Tyre until this. He had never seen the disciples there in Tyre. He's there, and after seven days he has to leave. And what do they do? They walk him out of the city. And not just the, not just the men, but the women and the children, the wives and their children all accompany Paul. I think this gives us a little bit of an insight into the heart of Paul and into you know, his demeanor. I think often we can get this kind of wrong idea about Paul that he's rough and gruff and everywhere he goes he's getting into fights for the gospel and he's just standing up and debating everybody and he's just this intellectual monster. I think the truth is that Paul loved people, man. He loved them. And everywhere he went, they recognized the love of God that was in Paul. They recognized the love that he had for the brethren. It, it spilled out of it, poured out of him. And, and listen, if you're so filled with the love of God that it pours out of you everywhere you go, that is contagious. And as a result, the brethren, they love you back. And so Paul was heading out of there after only spending seven days with them, and they're all accompanying him out of the city. I, I heard a commentator uh, this week say, well, this is the custom back in the day. I don't, listen, they didn't know Paul at all. He's not some dignitary that comes into the city and now the whole city has to give him a parade as he leaves. No, the, the love of Paul was contagious in the heart of the believers and they wanted to accompany him out of the city. And then look at the heart of Paul. Look at what he does. He kneels down and prays on the shore of Tyre before he gets into that boat again, before he leaves those Christians. He knows he's never going to see him. He got to meet him there for seven days. And what does he do? He kneels down with them and he prays. That's his heart for these people. He prays with them. Listen, that should be us. Everywhere we go, everyone we encounter, we should be willing and ready to pray at any moment. Corey has a great saying, and I don't remember it. Just like, <laughs> he says we have to be ready. It's something like this. We have to be ready at all times. What is it, Corey, to pray, preach, sing, and die? Something like that. He messed up a quote of mine on Wednesday if you guys were here, so I just had to return the favor. I feel like he adds more to that every time. But it's true. In every moment, Paul, recognizing that he, he's going to die, recognizing that he's walking into chains and tribulations, he says he has to pray with these Christians. He has to kneel down and pray before he leaves them. And so, when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. 
And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. It's see, everywhere he goes, he's greeting the brethren. Everywhere he goes, there's believers. Everywhere he's going, there's a church established in Ptolemais. It's modern day Acre there on the, uh, it's in northern Israel. It's on the shore, it's a, it's a harbor town. He comes there, and there's believers. And he greets the brethren and stay with them one day. And on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this blows my mind. You guys know who Philip is, right? You guys remember he was one of the seven. As the church was growing in Jerusalem, they came together and they prayed. They chose seven men of good character, filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they came together, laid hands on them, they prayed for them. And they appointed them as the first deacons of the church there in Jerusalem. Stephen was one of these men. There were seven men. Stephen and Philip, two of those men. Stephen was martyred. He was killed, right? Uh, turn back with me to Acts chapter 4. Keep your, uh, keep your spot there in Acts 20. I'm sorry, it's not Acts chapter 4. It's Acts chapter 8. Sorry, guys. At the end of Acts chapter 7, I'm just going to read to you what it says. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died, right? Verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered. Remember that word, diaspora. Remember we talked about that as we worked through chapter 8. They were scattered. Why? Because a great persecution had arisen in the church in Jerusalem, starting with the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen was stoned to death, and who was there consenting to the stoning of Stephen? That word consenting is an important word. That means he oversaw it. That means he was in charge of it. It was Saul of Tarsus. Who is Saul of Tarsus? Paul the Apostle. And so, he oversaw the martyrdom of Stephen, the stoning to death of Philip's friend. And then persecution arises, verse 2, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Listen, Acts chapter 8 is about 20 years before Acts chapter 21, okay? So 20 years earlier, the last time that Paul and Philip had anything to do with each other, what was happening? Paul killed his friend, oversaw the murder of Stephen, and was persecuting the church like had never had, he was wreaking havoc. That's that word is like a wild animal devouring their prey. He was brutal to the church. Paul will say in another place that he persecuted Christians beyond measure. Okay, that he compelled them to blasphemy at the edge of a sword. That he was murdering Christians, and as a result, the church there in Jerusalem had to spread out. Philip had to flee Jerusalem. Philip, the evangelist, Philip, one of the seven, had to free, uh, flee Jerusalem, he, and he ran away because of Paul to Samaria to preach the gospel. And now, 20 years later, Paul comes into Caesarea, and who's there? Philip. 
This is crazy to me. This blows my mind. Nowhere, nowhere else, in, I mean, Paul had already been through Caesarea in the book of Acts, but he had never come to the house of Philip. Maybe Philip had heard of Paul. I'm sure he had been hearing that Paul was converted. But you can imagine for Philip, this has to be difficult. The last time he saw this man, he killed his friend and persecuted the church to the point where he had to flee Jerusalem. He had to leave. He was scattered. And now, 20 years later, Paul is entering into Caesarea. And there's Philip. And Paul comes to his house. Listen, this is important for us, okay? This is important. Because what does it say happens? I mean, when you consider that the last time they met, that the last time they had anything to do with each other, Paul was looking to kill Philip. He literally wanted to murder him. Just for the sake of being a Christian, because of his belief in Jesus, Paul wanted to kill him. And he had to flee. Now here comes Paul, and you could expect Philip to be meeting him and trying him out, right? Like, oh, you say you're a Christian, let's see. Testing him. It doesn't say any of that. Not only that, he lets him stay with him. Not only that, but he has four young daughters under the age of 18. And he allows Paul, Saul, one, formerly Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, literally the Antichrist at that point, one filled with the spirit of Antichrist looking to destroy the work of Jesus. He invites him into his house and lets him stay. What should that say to us? What reason do we not have to forgive someone? Man, churches are divided all over because of unforgiveness in the hearts of people. Because of people who are unwilling to forgive someone else. Listen, I, I, I understand, man, forgiveness is difficult, especially with someone who is unrepentant. Especially with someone who's not sorry for what they did. It's hard. But do you think that the words of Stephen were echoing in the ears of Philip as he sees Paul again? Lord, don't charge them with this. They don't know what they're doing. Don't charge them with this sin, Lord. They don't know. They don't realize. They don't realize that they're persecuting you. They're actually doing it uh, as a zeal for you, for the Lord, thinking that they're doing his work. They don't yet understand that they're persecuting you, Lord, as they're killing me. And you think, as Philip sees Paul again, I wonder if those words of Stephen are echoing in his ears when he recognizes that the Lord has done an amazing work in Paul, not only to reconcile him to himself, but also to send him out with a martyred life to preach the gospel to the whole world. Philip receives him, man. Look at what it says. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Not only did Philip put up Paul, but also all the companions that were with him. They all stayed with Philip the evangelist. I love that they call him the evangelist. They're not calling him the deacon. He was a deacon. He was... One of the first deacons appointed to the church in Jerusalem. But he's recognized here in the book of Acts as Luke is inspired by the Spirit of God to write this. He's recognized as Philip the evangelist. Wouldn't that be awesome to be recognized as the one who went out to share the gospel with people who needed to know it? Remember what we saw as, as Philip was sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. He had left Samaria where there's this great revival and he's brought into the desert by the Holy Spirit to meet with him. one man, a eunuch from Ethiopia. And as a result, that man's heart is transformed and he goes back into Ethiopia. And we know through history that that whole area was transformed by the gospel. Thriving church in that area. And I believe it's as a result of this man, Philip, the evangelist. He'll always go down in history as the one who went out to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. So they come into his house, and he had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Unmarried, virgin, young daughters. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, this isn't the first time Paul had a run in with Agabus. In fact, we can read about him. Previously, about 15 years earlier in Acts, as he came to Antioch, remember when Paul and Barnabas were, were uh, pastoring there in Antioch, and he told them of a famine, a, a famine that was going to come upon the whole world, and that happened in the reign of Claudius Caesar. And what happened as a result of that? 
Paul and Barnabas bring an offering to Jerusalem. Remember, they go to Jerusalem. And I love this because you can also read about that in Galatians chapter 2. Paul's trip to Jerusalem as he met uh, with Peter and those who were uh, pillars in the church to make sure that he hadn't been running in vain. Paul comes to Jerusalem, brings this love offering, goes back to Antioch. And what happens as a result of that? He goes on his first missionary journey. Him and Barnabas go out set on preaching the gospel to the world, to evangelize the world. So Agabus comes, and he comes down from Judea. I love this, because why does he come? I don't know. The Holy Spirit laid it on his heart to come, that he had something to speak to Paul. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Listen to that. Agabus comes again, meets with Paul. It's been 15 years since they've seen each other. He comes, he takes Paul's belt, he binds himself up with the belt, and he says, look, the Holy Spirit is testifying that the Jews are going to do this to the man who owns this belt. And you can imagine Paul is like, yeah, man, nice to see you too. It's been a while. Listen, he knows this, right? I think this is what it means when Paul says that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city. Everywhere he goes, that chains and tribulations are awaiting him in Jerusalem. It's not only by the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that is happening in the heart of Paul, but also Paul, I mean, the Holy Spirit is bringing men and women alongside Paul and testifying to Paul that chains and tribulations are awaiting him there. But what do you notice that Agabus doesn't say? He doesn't say, the Holy Spirit is warning me that this is going to happen if you go to Jerusalem, so don't go. He doesn't say that, does he? He says that the Holy Spirit is testifying that this is going to happen to the one who owns this belt in Jerusalem. That they are going to do this to the one who owns this belt. And he never says, so don't go, Paul. It's just the Holy Spirit preparing Paul for what's coming. Now, as a result of this prophecy that goes out, this foretelling of the future, this foretelling of the Word of God, as Agabus tells uh, tells, uh, Paul what the Holy Spirit is testifying unto him, Then, in verse 12, it says, Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, does the Holy Spirit plead with Paul not to go to Jerusalem? Or is it the people that are with Paul? Listen, this is important. It's important for us to consider because often the Holy Spirit will lay something on our heart and we as fallible humans will misinterpret that. We give this prophetic word and we need to be careful about saying, thus says the Lord, right? We need to be careful about how we say that because often we put our own flavor on what the Lord is trying to say, right? It it comes with a little bit of us on it. Agabus just plainly says, look, the Holy Spirit is saying that you're going to be bound in Jerusalem, the one who owns this belt. And then as a result, Luke... And the men who are with him are pleading with Paul. They're trying to say, Paul, don't go. They're trying to dissuade him from going. They're saying, look, we know you said you're bound in the Spirit, but we're begging you, Paul, not to go. They're pleading with Paul not to go. They're weeping over it. They don't want Paul to go. But look at Paul's answer. Now, what I find crazy about this is they've heard this also along with Paul in every city, and they've never said anything until now. I don't know if it's because Agabus is saying it. He's got pretty good standing in the church as a prophet. I mean, this famine that he talked about 15 years earlier came true. or I don't know what it is. But for some reason now, all of a sudden, their hearts are breaking, and they don't want Paul to go. And they're pleading. They're begging him not to go. Now look at Paul's answer. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul says to them, look, why? Why are you crying? Why are you breaking my heart like this? Why are you pleading me not to go, not to fulfill the calling that the Lord has given me, not to walk in this 
in this path that the Lord has laid before me and asked me to go. It's breaking my heart. This gives us the heart of Paul. He loves these people. He doesn't want to hurt them, even if it means hurting himself. Look, Paul's not worried about him. He's not worried about what's awaiting him in Jerusalem. He's not worried about what the Jews are going to do to him. He's worried about the hearts of these people who are breaking for him. He's like, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound in Jerusalem, but also to die. If that's what the Lord has for me. I love this because Paul is giving us insight here of all of these things that have happened to Paul. All of these threats of physical torment. All of these threats of imprisonment. All of these actual beatings that Paul has endured. None of that has ever broken his heart. None of that has ever brought him to a place where he's, can, where, where he's faulting, where he's faltering, where he's wavering. But here he says, look, why are you breaking my heart? That's the heart of Paul. He's not worried about himself. He's worried about them. He's saying, it's breaking my heart that you feel this way. But look, I'm bound in the Spirit. In, in, uh, in Corinth, on, on the end of this missionary journey, as Paul was in Greece, before he was heading back, he wrote the book of Romans. You realize that? So by the time he gets here, he has already written the book of Romans. And if you get a moment, we don't have time, read the end of Romans chapter 8. Because Paul was persuaded already that nothing could separate him from the love of God which was in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death, not sword, not famine, not tribulation, none of that. Paul was saying, I'm ready. I'm ready even to die. Nothing is going to knock me off of my calling. Nothing is going to cause me to stray from the path that the Lord has called me to. And here's my question for you this morning. What would it take to knock you off the path that the Lord has called you to? What would it take to cause you to stray? Have you purposed in your heart the way Paul has? Are you so secure in the fact that you've heard from the Lord and, and where you're walking and you're calling from Him? Are you so sure that nothing can knock you away from it? That nothing can cause you to stray? That nothing will pull you away from the calling? If you're not that sure, I'm asking you right now to pray, to seek the Lord. Because he can give you that surety. He can give you that strength. He can give you that conviction that causes you to walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. You've been called to be a representative of Jesus. You've been called to pick up your cross and follow him. You've been called to die to yourself and follow Jesus. Paul will say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul is finishing his race with joy. Listen, finish well. You don't know when the end is. You don't know when the finish line is coming. It could be today, tomorrow, it could be the next day, it could be 50 years from now. But if you recognize that that finish line could come at any time, spend every day finishing well. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Recognize, like Paul, that the Lord has equipped you with people around you to help you to run this race, to help you to run it well, to help you to run it with joy, to help you to finish this race with joy. He has equipped you with people around you, but first and foremost and most importantly, he has equipped you with the Holy Spirit, God himself, who lives within you. You are never alone. You're never running this race by yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the testimony of Paul. Lord, thank you for the testimony of these uh, believers in the early church that we read about in, your, in, in the book of Acts. Lord, I pray that you would uh, set our hearts on fire for the gospel. Lord, that you would cement our feet to the rock of Jesus Christ, that we would be established and steadfast in our faith so that... When the tide of culture pulls against us, Lord, that we would be able to stand fast. That we, would be able, that we would be able to shine as a light in a dark world. Lord, help us to allow the people around us who you've placed in our life to accompany us in this race. Help us to allow them to minister to us, Lord, as we minister to them. 
Refresh us, Lord, by your spirit and through your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.